It's without question that Mick Foley is an icon in professional wrestling. He made huge sacrifices to his body to make a name for himself, most notably in WWE during the 90s and early 2000s. And every wrestling fan can tell you about the times he went off the top of Hell in a Cell or the thrilling, terrifying moment he was speared through a flaming table at WrestleMania. Foley was a wrestler of many characters, each portrayed with equal delight. His 1996 debut in WWE as Mankind was fascinating, a gimmick like nothing we'd ever seen before. While Mankind started as a basement-dwelling freak, he would later develop into the character of lovable rogue that could absorb an insane amount of punishment, and he defeated foes by stuffing a sock puppet named Mr. Socko into their mouths. While Mankind may be the most fondly remembered version of Mick Foley, it would be the character of Cactus Jack that brought him to the dance. <laughs> In contrast to Mankind, Foley portrayed Cactus Jack as a brash, bloodthirsty, hardcore outlaw, hailing from Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. In 1991, Mick Foley debuted in WCW and his reputation preceded him. Foley had already appeared for World Class Championship Wrestling and had started making a name for himself as being willing to take a sickening amount of punishment in the ring. Most of his fellow wrestlers in the WCW locker room had heard about his hardiness in the ring and were especially impressed, and in some cases concerned, with his elbow drop finisher that was often utilised by diving off the ring apron onto the cold, concrete floor outside. In an interview, Michael Hayes said, I didn't think he'd be walking past the age of 30 when I first started seeing him. He was taking ludicrous, crazy bumps and that's what he was getting known for. I was worried that he wasn't going to succeed at first, and he would end up crippled. In the early 90s, WCW struggled to find believable heels to battle their new superstar babyface, Sting. Sting was WCW champion at the time. He was the exciting young hero that was going to carry the company into the decade of the 1990s. But for every hero, there must be a despicable villain, and Cactus Jack fit the bill perfectly. Cactus Jack attacked Sting and made a huge mark immediately in everyone's mind when he dropped a huge elbow drop from the top turnbuckle. Foley would later say that his feud with Sting was a career maker and it put him on the map. Foley eventually started to get cheered by the WCW fans. They understood that Cactus Jack was going above and beyond every night for their entertainment, putting his body on the line, and they appreciated it. And so, Foley was soon lined up to face the company's new number one mega heel, Vader. Vader hit hard, and Foley was able to absorb the punishment and give it to him back. It was clear to the viewers everywhere that the men weren't playing. The matches were totally brutal. Foley was increasing his reputation as one of the most extreme wrestlers in the world, and that reputation would certainly not be lessened one fateful night in 1994. It was a WCW house show in Germany when Foley would lose his ear. During a point in the match, Foley was guillotined in the ropes. It was a standard spot at the time, and he'd done it many times before. However, on this occasion, the ring ropes had been tightened up too much by an inexperienced ring crew when they were building the ring, and Foley's head became trapped between the two ropes. Foley was trapped so tightly that he thought he was going to die of strangulation. Foley pulled his head through the ropes so hard that one of his ears became split at the back. Once Foley stepped back into the ring, Vader reached up, grabbed Cactus by the right ear and tore it clean off his head. After this crazy moment, word quickly got around the industry that Foley was truly hardcore. Everyone recognised that he was one of the toughest men the wrestling industry had ever seen. Everyone realised, apart from the bosses in WCW. In an interview, Foley would later say, Getting on the microphone and getting revenge on the man responsible for costing my ear would have been big money, and that was not what was wanted from me. There was nothing done with it, and so I gave my notice. 
Foley left a guaranteed contract when he decided to leave the company and forfeited the most money he'd ever made in his entire career. WCW also made him work a four-month notice period before he could leave for his new home, Extreme Championship Wrestling. During that notice period, Foley got an early taste of life in ECW thanks to a talent exchange that was agreed between them and WCW at the time that came about due to a lawsuit settlement. The ECW fans had a dream match that they wanted Foley to be involved in upon his arrival in the company, and that was Cactus Jack versus the suicidal, homicidal, genocidal maniac, Sabu. Paul Heyman had loved Mick Foley ever since they first worked together in the early 90s, and Heyman was always one to give the fans what they wanted. The match took place at Hostile City Showdown in June 1994 and was hotly anticipated. In the end, Sabu would win the match after Paul Heyman interfered and smashed his massive mobile phone over Cactus Jack's head. After the match, Cactus Jack cut a promo backstage where he spat on his WCW Tag Team Championship and threw it down on the floor. In the promo, he praised Sabu and admitted that he'd lost the most important title of all to him that night, the title of most suicidal wrestler. Foley would later say, I got a lot of heat for spitting on the WCW tag belts. I still maintain that the people in charge would not have been so upset, Ric Flair in particular, if they'd actually seen the interview instead of just hearing about it. Because what I was doing was saying the tag team belt was important to me, but not as important as my pride which I felt like I'd lost that night at the ECW arena. The old guard in WCW might not have liked Foley's actions during this brief trip to ECW, but spitting on the WCW tag belts got Foley over huge with the ECW fans. It was the exact kind of action that they lapped up, and it was the icing on the cake after the match. Foley would later say, I was told, hey, help these guys out, and I wanted to help them out, not only with what I could do in the ring, but also what I could do on the mic. And I thought Sabu deserved to be established as the top guy, and I thought I'd do what I could to make that happen. Foley would only spend another couple of months working his notice in WCW before leaving them for good. ECW was fertile ground for growing his reputation. Mick brought an unadulterated, uninhibited style a willingness to sacrifice that others had to match, and he raised the bar in terms of sacrifice when it came to the ECW locker room. Wrestling fans around the world already knew who Cactus Jack was and the reputation he'd already built. If nothing else, WCW, with their worldwide reach, had made him a star. Plus, he was already proven as one tough bastard, a wrestler that should be respected, he was legitimately hardcore, and he fit right into ECW. Foley entered ECW in 1994 at exactly the time it was making a name for itself as being extreme. The promotion at the time was called Eastern Championship Wrestling when Foley debuted. However, the promotion would be renamed Extreme during the year once they'd withdrawn from the National Wrestling Alliance. The company was arguably at its most extreme during those first two years after adopting the new name. They wanted to make a name for themselves and live up to that moniker as being extreme, and so the violence was turned all the way up to 11. Foley made his return to the ECW arena in Philadelphia at the end of September 1994. He'd already agreed with Paul Heyman that despite also taking side indie bookings and bookings in Japan, he would make ECW his top priority and would appear on each of the four shows per month the company was producing at the time. Foley would later say that he felt that his best promo work happened in ECW when he was carrying a lot of anger and frustration, not only from his time in WCW, but also thanks to being continually ignored by WWE. He would watch Monday Night Raw and see less talented wrestlers portraying dumb gimmicks and wonder why he wasn't considered good enough to be in WWE. He said, It was offensive to me that the phone wasn't ringing, but there was a lot of frustration. Luckily for me, there was no Twitter available 
so I wouldn't have an instant outlet. What I had was an ability to let things build in my mind and then I would let out very real emotion in these wrestling interviews. Foley would bring star power to ECW, but like so many others before and after him, he used the place himself as a fertile ground to sharpen his skills. Paul Heyman was the antithesis of the likes of Vince McMahon in that he encouraged his performers to experiment and grow both in and out of the ring and he gave them time to do that on screen. We were shooting the very first Mick Foley Cactus Jack villain promos and we knew we'd struck gold five seconds after the cameras went on. He just hit. It was a transformation, said Paul Heyman. Mick really proved himself to be a fantastic writer, even an actor, by writing that verbiage, that dialogue and reciting it so perfectly in terms of timing and inflection and facial expressions. It made for fantastic television. Throughout his ECW career, Cactus Jack was thrust into matches against Terry Funk. Funk was a pioneer, having made his name in the Southern Territories of Florida Championship Wrestling and the Continental Wrestling Association, all while cutting his teeth internationally in All Japan Pro Wrestling during the glory days of the Japanese game. Funk was a battle-hardened yet soft-spoken veteran who changed his wrestling style in the early 90s to be in tune with ECW. He became extreme. Terry Funk and Mick Foley would spark up a kinship in ECW that was forged in blood and barbed wire. In Funk, Foley found a friend and an opponent that could absorb and dish out as much punishment as he could. While appearing for ECW, the men would also travel to Japan and perform in FMW, a promotion that was formed in 1989 and specialised in hardcore wrestling. While Paul Heyman was introducing North America to hardcore wrestling, it's safe to say that FMW had taken things to, well, even more of an extreme. FMW promoted Japanese death matches and they were ultra violent and the ones between Cactus Jack and Terry Funk were no different. It was a no rope barbed wire explosive barbed wire board time bomb death match. The contest was brutal, bloody and very dangerous. After the match both men were galvanised as being hardcore legends around the world and back in ECW the feud between the two men would continue. After a match one night between Funk and Cactus Jack the public enemy invaded the ring leading to the two men pairing up with each other to fight the public enemy off and get them out of the ring. Funk yelled at Jack to get a chair but there were none in easy reach and so the hundreds of hardcore fans at ringside proceeded to throw their own into the ring in a cascade of plastic chairs. It's an iconic visual that remains ingrained in the minds of wrestling fans to this very day. On another occasion the pair fought in a no rope barbed wire match that ended with Jack being caned with a kendo stick 46 times by both Funk and the Sandman. Foley's time in ECW is often remembered for his long-spanning feud with the Sandman as they would brutalise each other in nine separate singles matches including a Texas death match. After his matches with the Sandman, the ECW fans expected Foley to get more and more extreme with barbed wire and even fire being introduced into his matches. There was one ECW fan that infamously brought a sign to a show that read Kane Dewey, which was referring to Foley's own three-year-old son. The fan wanted to see Cactus Jack cane his own son with a kendo stick in an ECW ring. The promo that Cactus Jack cut in the face of seeing that sign was monumental. It was a hurt-filled, visceral monologue that revealed a man that had been pushed too far by the wrestling business. In that promo, he referred to Tommy Dreamer. Tommy Dreamer was a wrestler that had initially struggled to get over with the fans. That was until the Sandman caned him multiple times and Tommy ended up begging for more. From that moment onwards, Tommy Dreamer became the embodiment of hardcore, the living representative of what ECW stood for. After briefly tag-teaming with Dreamer, Jack would turn heel and DDT'd him onto a concrete floor, 
Cactus Jack denounced hardcore wrestling in the process. In a promo, Cactus Jack talked about how hardcore wrestling had ruined the lives of countless wrestlers before them. He wanted to save Tommy Dreamer from the same fate. It was a really clever way of getting Cactus Jack over as a heel, as the storyline withheld exactly what the ECW fans wanted from him, as Cactus Jack would stop using weapons and he stopped brawling on the outside of the ring too. Eventually, Cactus Jack betrayed Dreamer even further by joining his nemesis Raven, becoming a member of Raven's Nest. Raven was a character that was miserly and depressed. He was a misanthrope that would deliver almost poetic promos to the camera. He almost became a cult leader type character when he formed the Nest, which was made up of other wrestlers who had the same kind of mindset as him. Jack even tried to lure fan favourite Mikey Whipwreck into the group, but to no avail. Mikey Whipwreck was a small 19 year old teenager who grew up a huge fan of Cactus Jack. His training came from a gentleman named Sonny Blaze, who in turn had been trained by Foley himself. Whipwreck lacked coordination so much that Blaze refused to charge him for the wrestling training. He was so assured that nothing would ever come of him. Unknown to Blaze at the time, ECW would become the land of the misfits, and if anyone could turn Whipwreck into an extreme superstar, it was Paul Heyman. Heyman saw Whipwreck messing around in the ring one evening, and he decided to give him a chance. For the purposes of believability, Whipwreck was cast as a loser and he made a great whipping boy for the real stars at the time who would give him an incredible ass whipping every single night, much to the joy of ECW's mob of fans. However, it quickly became evident that Whipwreck had real talent alongside his willingness to absorb huge amounts of punishment. The fans started to realise that Whipwreck was really good at taking an ass kicking for their enjoyment and soon took him to their hearts. Foley had been without his tag team partner in Terry Funk for a while as he took time away from the company, and so Cactus Jack was left without a tag team partner for his match against the public enemy. The ECW arena exploded when Cactus announced that Whipwreck would be his new tag team partner. That night, Cactus Jack and Mikey Whipwreck won the ECW tag team titles, and the fans loved this new tag team that had been forged in ultra-violence. Foley took Whipwreck under his wing, seeing a lot of himself in the young kid. Of course, this being wrestling, the tag team couldn't last forever, and fittingly, the men would face each other in Foley's last match in ECW. Foley was off to start a new chapter in his career with WWE. He'd finally got the call that he'd been waiting for. Word got out amongst the ECW fans that Cactus Jack was about to depart, and so Foley wove that into his character the months before he left, with Cactus Jack becoming a mega heel as he sang the praises of Vince McMahon and even billed himself as being from Stamford, Connecticut, the home of WWE. In reality, Foley was dreading this final match in the company. He'd whipped the ECW fans into a frenzy with his heel tactics, and so he even predicted a riot on the night. In the end, Foley need not have worried. On his last night in ECW, he got a standing ovation from the fans, with chants of, please don't go, please don't go, ringing throughout the ECW arena. 